So let's get right into it. Uh, we're starting a brand new sermon series today, and this is uh, uh, something I am extremely honored that I get to kick this off. We're going to be working our way through a book of the Bible entitled 1 Corinthians. It's actually a letter written by a man named Paul to a, uh, the church in a place called Corinth. And you'll hear 1 Corinthians uh, quoted all the time, not just at weddings. And I think uh, the reason that it's quoted so often is that, you know, there's not a topic or an issue out there that the church has to deal with that 1 Corinthians does not address. And we've titled the series, uh, A Messy Church Loved by God. And we're going to see a little bit this morning how messy it is, nevertheless loved by God because it is the church. Uh, today, however, we're not going to start in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, but rather in the book of Acts. Uh, before we can get to the letter that was written to the church in Corinth, we have to take a look at Paul's visit to the city of Corinth that predated the writing of the letter. Uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at today is in the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, and we're going to examine the first 17 verses. So if you have your Bibles, you can pull it out. We'll have the, uh, the uh, verses on the screen, but... Before we dive in, I know I need the Lord's help, so let's go to him now in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you. Uh, like I said, you are so good, and people clap. They have experienced your, your uh, goodness in their life as well. And we are an undeserving people, Lord, and, but yet you are still very kind to us, and, and that is because it flows out of who you are. It is your nature. And so right now, we just simply say thank you. And I ask that you would help us this morning, help me to uh, speak clearly, uh, calm my nerves a little bit, Lord, and I just ask that uh, you would <clears throat> be here in a very powerful way, that you would uh, give all of us eyes to see and ears to hear and you know, a tender, soft heart to receive what it is that you have for us today. Uh, we thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, if you'd stand with me, we're going to read, uh, we're going to hear from the Lord here in the book of Acts, chapter 18. I said we're going to cover 17 verses, but I want to just start with the first three. We're going to kind of take things in small bites and, and work from there. So verse 1, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Thank you. You may have a seat. So let's just walk through this passage and see what we find. Verse 1 says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So who is this guy, Paul? Now, I don't want to assume that we all have a, you know, a working knowledge of the Apostle Paul. So let's just give a quick biographical sketch. He was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, and prior to his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, he was basically a religious terrorist, uh, a very antagonistic enemy of the gospel. So one day, Jesus comes to this persecutor of Christians and quite literally knocks him off of his high horse, and Paul has this absolute radical conversion. And God uses Paul to then spread the gospel throughout the region, and he ends up writing a huge portion of what we now call the New Testament. And for those of you are, that are here today, I think this is a, maybe the first bit of encouragement that I can give to you. You know, you maybe have uh, friends or family or you know, people that you love, and you've been telling them about Jesus, and maybe they're antagonistic. You know, maybe, maybe they're actively working against God's agenda, or maybe they're just completely apathetic. And you say, you know... They're just never going to come to faith. Well, I think God gives us, as an example, the Apostle Paul. By the time we get to Acts 18, Paul's on his second missionary journey, and he's planted churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. And you might think, well, that sounds wonderful, church planning. And it is. It's great. But the truth is, he was beaten and imprisoned in Philippi, run out of town in Thessalonica and Berea and ridiculed as an idle babbler from the sophisticated elite in Athens. So now he's making his way here to Corinth. So he's got to be tired. You know, he's a, he's a bit worn out, discouraged, and alone. And sometimes I think we, we read in our Bibles about uh, people in the Scriptures, and we put them up on this high pedestal. 
And, you know, what we got to realize is they go through the same stress and discouragement that we do. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us how he felt during those days, those first few days that he was in Corinth. He uses words like weakness, fear, and much trembling. You know, even though Paul was a giant in the faith, he struggles with many, if not all, of the things that we struggle with today. So what was the city of Corinth like in the first century? Uh, I grabbed a commentary by Dr. James Boyce. Uh, he has since gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, he wrote something that was just helpful to me. I, I always like when really smart people bring things down to my level. And I remember reading in the commentary, and I think it was quite literally, he says, the city of Corinth begins with the letter C. I was like, okay, I'm with you so far, Dr. Boyce, I got gotcha. you. He says, I'm going to give you three more words that start with the letter C that will help you understand what Corinth was like in Paul's day. The first C is cosmopolitan. It was a city that had a mixture of many different people and races. And the reason for that is because it was a commercial city. And that's the second word that begins with C. It had two harbors, and the city's location in the Roman Empire allowed for the exchanging of goods. It was very convenient because it had trade routes that went in all different directions. So it was a city of sailors. So, you know, not surprisingly, uh, Poseidon, the Greek god of the sea, was worshipped there. And that leads us to the last uh, word that begins with C, and that is Corinth was corrupt. The cosmopolitan and commercial aspects of Corinth made it a little bit like New York City, but the corruption of Corinth made it a lot like Las Vegas. You know, the phrase, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, may have been uttered as people traveled through there. And Corinth was the big leagues for sexual immorality. You know, the city was the center of worship for the goddess of sex named Aphrodite. The city had this temple that was home to a thousand priestesses who were, in effect, prostitutes uh, who served the god by Corinthianizing. And that was a, a term that was known all throughout the region for somebody who was acting out and practicing sexual immorality. So here comes Paul. He's coming from Athens, you know, the city that glorified the mind and the intellect. And he comes to Corinth, the city that glorified the body and sexuality. You know, the ancient version of Sin City. And he found a Jew there named Aquila with his wife Priscilla. You know, we're introduced to this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And when they became Christians, we don't really know. The uh, Bible's not really clear on that. But here they are serving the Lord. And their names rhyme, which I, I think is very cute, okay? Uh, that my dad and my uh, stepmom, they have names that rhyme, and their names are Joe and Roe. But Joe and Roe take it to a whole new level because they are Joe and Roe Bongo. So that's like 16 bars of a rap song there. You know, so here's Paul. He's discouraged and alone. And look how God provides for his weary servant. He gives Paul companionship. And not just a friend. He gives him two friends. And not just two friends, but fellow tent makers and brothers and sisters in the Lord. And sometimes all we need is someone to come alongside of us and give us a little bit of support. Isn't that true? I mean, you know, we need some help. And, you know, maybe you're like me. You come to, to church sometimes and you know, you're just feeling down. You know, you're just, maybe you're feeling that way today. And maybe you've connected with somebody here that, you know, you have a common interest. You have this, you know, bond. And, you know, before you, you know it, your spirit is, is lifted up. You know, in my context, uh, downstairs with the kids, uh, sometimes... I'm just not in the mood to be here. Uh, that's just being real. But every time I come around, and you know why? It's this little girl right here named Sarah. She's an example of, yes, Sarah, you, I'm talking about you. She, these kids come in, they got their Sunday best on, right? And they come in and they're smiling. Hey, Mr. Mike, you know, give me a, a high five or a hug. And, you know, just try and stay in a bad mood when that happens. So, I mean, we... We need companionship. We need each other. And that's one of the ways that God provided for his servant, Paul. An interesting footnote about Aquila and Priscilla is that they are never mentioned separately in Scripture. You know, how sweet is it to see a husband and wife team serving the Lord while serving alongside one another? You know, I tell our, our husband and wife teams downstairs that, that help out with the kids, you know, I say, you guys bring something special to the ministry because they do. You know, we have kids in our church that, you know, from broken homes. Uh, 
single parents, a single mom or a single dad, possibly even experiencing abuse. You know, I'm from a broken, dysfunctional home myself. You know, if we can model what, what a godly marriage looks like to the kids, you know, who, who may have never seen it at all or maybe don't see it on a regular basis, there's great value in that. And sometimes when, you know, it seems as though whenever somebody's up here talking about volunteers, you know, we're usually asking for more uh, because there is a constant need. But that might lead you to a wrong conclusion about our church family is that, you know, people aren't serving. And that's simply not true. You know, I, I thought about some of the couples who serve here together at Living Water. And I think of the Georges, the Petas, the McDonald's, the Brengles, Stauffers, Catings, Kings, Smiths serving alongside one another like Priscilla and Aquila. And that's just to name a few. I mean, I know there's people that I missed, and for that I apologize, but I want to say thank you. And I'm grateful for what you guys bring to this body of believers, and yes, we could use more like you. Back to Acts 18 in uh, verse 4, and he, that's Paul, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul goes into the synagogue here and he's, he's telling the Jews, Hey, Jesus is the Christ. And they're not having it. You know, when we share our faith and and you know, nowadays in, in, in modern times, not everyone's going to view it as good news just like they didn't, okay? We will undoubtedly face opposition. No matter how persuasive we may be, no matter how, you know, heartfelt and passionate we, we deliver the message and our sincerity, there are some people that are just going to flat out reject it. I'd like to share an experience with you from my life. Uh, in my notes here, it says, tell the story about a woman you met at a hotel, um, those words are a good reminder of something called context, okay? <laughs> me meeting a woman at a hotel sounds really bad. Let me explain. A few years ago when I was working here as a janitor, I would often get done late at night. And uh, you know, while I'm vacuuming and doing things like that, I would, I would listen to uh, you know, preaching and teaching with, with headphones. And I would just get so stirred up. I'm like, I got to share the gospel with somebody. So I'd want to go out and find somebody. Well, one time, it was, uh, it was during the winter, so it was cold, and I, you know, so people aren't outside, so I thought, well, I'll go to a hotel where I know that they have uh, you know, a smoking section outside, and smokers, they need to smoke, so they go outside uh, to the smoking area, and you know, I, I personally love smokers, I do, uh, I feel bad for them, we've taken away their, their section in the restaurants, right, cigarettes cost like an arm and a leg, and they're forced to smoke outside. You know, they're put out like a modern-day leper today. And, you know, with every puff, they're getting closer and closer to meeting Jesus. So my thought is, I better introduce them. <laughs> so I'd stand off to the side. You know, I'd wait for people coming out, you know, packing their smokes. And, you know, truth be told, I, I used to be a smoker. And I was a Christian at the time. And I, and I still would light up, you know, trying to become all things to all people. Uh, but actually, in hindsight, as I, as I look back on that now, I realize that that was me just trying to relive my, my pagan days, and I've matured since then, so I don't do that anymore. But I was talking to this woman one night, and you know, she was very sophisticated and intelligent. I mean, straight out of Athens. You know, she, she had the, the business suit on and everything. And she, you know, we were speaking about like, the weather and stuff like that, but as soon as the conversation turned to Christ... The conversation changed drastically. She was like, you believe in God? You know, she said it with complete disdain in her voice. You know, don't give me that Jesus business. You know, I, I felt like an inch tall. You know, people started looking. You know, the polite conversation, you know, it, it turned ugly and ended very quickly. And I walked away discouraged. But God, in his kindness, he brought two thoughts to my mind. And one was this, that God reminded me that, you know, she wasn't rejecting me. She was rejecting him. You know, as an ambassador for Christ, I, yes, I took the brunt of it, but ultimately she was rejecting the Lord. You know, and when that happens, 
I think, you know, we can't throw a pity party for ourselves as we, you know, as I was doing that night. Uh, Our concern at that point needs to go away from us and towards that individual because they are in danger. And the other thought was that Jesus himself, he said that this type of stuff would happen. Uh, Jesus has a very interesting take. He said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I mean, I love the fact that we serve a God who's upfront and honest. He tells you, he gives you the bad news, like this is going to happen. Okay, and truth be told, I mean, that little encounter I had with that, that lady, I mean, it's hard to even call that persecution compared to what our brothers and sisters are facing on an everyday basis around the globe. But, you know, this experience for me, was, uh, it was an eye-opener. I'm a new believer, and I'm like, wow, you know, not everybody loves Jesus. You know? And some people really hate him. So back to, to the text. In verse 6, Paul has some very strong words and actions. You know, he's shaking out his garments and raising his voice. And I think you know, we first, in order to understand what was going on there, I think we've got to understand Paul's heart. He says in Romans 9, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jews. Look at Paul's love for his people, a group of people that he loves more than he loves himself. So when they opposed him and they reviled him, he shook out his garments. It reminds us of what Christ said to the apostles. You go into a city, they reject the message. They won't receive or listen to you, then shake the dust from your feet. You know, this was a a sign of judgment, you know, for, for those who would reject the gospel. And he says, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. A reference back to the prophet Ezekiel, who was Israel's uh, watchman. You know, the watchman was was there to provide a warning to the people. And I was reading through Ezekiel. I went to the chapter to see where Paul took, you know, took the, these, this wording from. And I was reading some Ezekiel this week, and wow, I don't know if you've read it. It is no joke. I mean, I'm, I was very like, convicted. It was very weighty on me. Let me just read to you a little bit what we, uh, one verse actually in Ezekiel 33. The Lord says this, If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. And I would simply ask, are you a faithful watchman? You know, let me let me make a a bold statement here, and I'll try and find the balance between being bold and, and saying it with humility. But you know, we as a church, I think we're failing. I think we're failing in this area. We're failing to warn people. You know, do we, when we talk about our faith or we talk to somebody about Jesus, do we, do we bring up things like sin, righteousness, and judgment? You know, I know it's not easy. It's, it's very difficult. That is the warning that is necessary. You know, and another thing that is hard is this right now. This preaching thing is very, very difficult because, you know, you know that I thought about it this week. You know when they say when you point your finger at somebody, you got those three fingers pointing back at you? Well, that is very, very true. That's very true, and I feel that every time I stand up here. But I think a, you know, good preaching puts it on you know, the people. We, we admonish. We try and tell you, no, we, and we're, not, we're not cutting it. We're not getting, getting the job done. But i got to ask myself that same question. Am I clean? You know, do I have blood on my hands? Let me give you a quote here from Charles Spurgeon. Here's what he said. It is absolutely necessary to the preaching of the gospel of Christ that men be warned as to what will happen if they continue in their sins. Your delicacy is cruelty. Your flatteries are poisons. You are a murderer. Shall we keep men in a fool's paradise? Shall we lull them into soft slumbers from which they will awake in hell? Are we to become helpers of their damnation by our smooth speeches? In the name of God, we will not. And I say, Amen, Pastor Spurgeon. Verse 7. And he, Paul, left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. 
Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So Paul leaves the synagogue and goes where? Right next door. You know, I love that. I mean, like he goes in there, you know, pronounces judgment upon the Jews, probably makes a big stink and like he's going to storm out and go down the street and he just goes right next door. You know, he stays right in proximity to where they were. And we see two conversions, Titus Justus, a Roman, and Crispus, a Jew. And he's not just any Jew. He was the leader of the synagogue. That conversion was huge. But look how God you know, provided a second time for Paul. He gives Paul converts, both Roman and Jewish. You know, Paul's faithfulness produced fruit for God. And you know, people came to faith. They believed and they were baptized. But that's what makes you know, these next few verses here a little bit confusing. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So why was Paul afraid? I mean, didn't he just see you know, conversions? He, he saw you know, God saving people at his preaching. You know, I think it was a combination of a couple of things that Paul had seen. You know, he saw both responses to the gospel. He saw people that rejected it, and then he saw the people that would embrace the gospel. And he had seen this before in other cities. So you know, Jewish opposition to Paul, it, that could mean a whole host of things. You know, it, it could mean that he would get beaten like before. You know, he could be stoned like before, put in jail like before, or run out of town like before. But history would not repeat itself this time. Why? God. God said he was with him. Very reminiscent of the words spoken by the risen Lord when he gave us uh, the great commission. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, can there be a greater comfort than to know that the Lord is with you and not against you? You know, imagine you're walking down the street, you're in a dangerous part of town, and uh, you know, it's, it's late at night, you have expensive jewelry on, you got a, like a leather jacket, and iPhone 6, and you're scared. And you don't know who's about to come around the corner. And then you see me. I show up in all of my 5'8 stature, unarmed, I don't know karate, and I come up to you and I say, hey, I know you're scared. Don't worry. No one will attack you to harm you, for I am with you. <laughs> yeah. How the laughter tells it all. You're going to say, great, now we're both going to get jacked. <laughs> when we talk about someone coming along to comfort us, it kind of depends on who it is, right? I mean, God, uh, Paul got this, this, uh, this confirmation from the all-powerful, omnipotent God of the universe. And what happened? He ended up staying there a year and a half, preaching and teaching the Word of God. You know, the last few words uh, that the Lord said to Paul in this vision are very interesting. He says, I have many in this city who are my people. You know, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists some of these people. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You know, even though these people had not yet believed in the gospel, they were nevertheless known by God. And that's quite the list there in 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, God delights in saving the worst of sinners. And I feel compelled to say this uh, after reading those few verses. You know, I've, it's my thought that there are people possibly in this room that should be terrified at those verses at hearing that, those words from God. If you're living a lifestyle of sexual immorality, you know, the Greek word for sexual immorality is pornaya. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, broad term, you know, wide-ranging. Uh, I heard it put as like a junk drawer term, and it, 
includes things like fornication, adultery, pornography, lust. I mean, if those types of things characterize who you are, you know what that text is saying to you? You're not going to heaven. That's why I say it ought to terrify us. We need to take that very, very seriously, especially in the the culture in which we live in today. You know, I know that's kind of like a a drive-by admonition there, but uh, you know, we'll get to to chapter six in First Corinthians, um, God willing. Um, I, like I said, I felt compelled to, to say that. Jesus says, "There's a lot of people in that city that belong to me." We need to hear that. You know, God has predestined, He has foreordained, He has chosen people in that city to be saved. And you know, some of you may be, you know, asking, "You mean God chooses who will be saved?" Yes, that is what Scripture teaches. Right here in the book of Acts, Acts 13.48 says this, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. People are appointed to eternal life? Acts 16.14, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opens the heart. You know, doesn't Lydia open her own heart? You know, what then is her responsibility? You know, isn't that the the age-old question? God's sovereignty versus man's responsibility? How is it that God is sovereign over salvation? He chooses. He elects. Yet at the same time, people are responsible for their own sins. Right? Anyone who goes to hell cannot have an excuse. They are without excuse for that. How can both be true? If God didn't open Lydia's heart, couldn't she just say, it's not my fault. God didn't open my heart. He didn't elect me. I'm suffering unjustly. With the remaining time that we have here today, it would be impossible for me to sufficiently cover this. Let me just say a few things. Scripture teaches both, you know, and they aren't contradictory. As a matter of fact, we see both right here in this text. God's sovereignty and human responsibility right in the same passage. Look at verse 6. Paul said to the Jews, your blood be upon what? Your own heads. Those in the synagogue who rejected uh, Christ as the Messiah, they are responsible for that. You know, make no mistake about it. Yet if you have come to Jesus like Crispus did, you know why you did? Because you were chosen before the world began. And that's what Ephesians 1 says. We must allow Scripture to speak. To understand Christianity, you have got to deal with paradoxes. You know, and I don't like that sometimes. I, I like things that are nice, you know, clear, clean cut, you know, easy to understand. And the problem that I run into is that you know, I want to take my pea brain and try and figure out the infinite mind of God. You know, we... We allow for paradoxes in other areas of Christian doctrine. I was listening to John MacArthur on this one, and he he asked the question, he said, who is Jesus, God or man? He was both, 100% God, 100% man. Well, that sounds like 200%. You know, that math doesn't really work out. Try that next time you go down to uh, Rita's. Say you're going to go down to Rita's and get a gelati. Tell the girl you want 100% custard, 100% ice. She's going to say to you, ah, that's not how it works. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke, right? Well, I thought it was the Holy Spirit. Paradox. You know, what we need to remember is this, and this is the important part. God says, if you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Take the water of life freely. You know, when we, we run into problems when we, when we say, well, you know, what if I'm not one of the elect? Well, then you won't come. If you want to come to Jesus, come. When we try to figure out you know, who's in and who's out, that's when we run into a problem. You know, we preach the gospel to all people everywhere. Let God be God. He will take care of it. Don't worry about it. He knows what He's doing. But now we run into another objection. The other objection is people will say, if God is the one who saves according to His sovereign choice, and all those who God chooses will come to Him, Why evangelize, right? Why share the gospel? I think that's a very good question. 
But I think it has a, a, many different answers. But the first one at the top of the list that I would say is, it's very simple. We're commanded to. Is that not enough? You know, God has said very clearly in Scripture, go into all the world, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That should be the end of the discussion. He commanded it, we obey. Simple. But there's more we could say. You know, doesn't this, you know, the, this view of salvation hinder evangelism, people will say. And I would say no. I would say no. It actually fuels it. Me personally, you know, I happen to be, be a, a Bible-believing, you know, monergistic, reformed believer, doctrines of grace. My favorite flower is the tulip, okay? I have, I have a sweatshirt at home that uh, was given to me, and it actually says on it, Calvin is my homeboy, okay? So if you're familiar with those terms, you know what I'm talking about, that should tell you where I stand. Yet I am passionate about evangelism. Why is that? Well, I think it's about understanding God's sovereignty. God is sovereign, yet we are a part of this. God is saving people, and the way he has chosen to do it is to use us. You know, could God just supernaturally save people without any means outside of himself? Sure, he could. But that's not what he has ordained. He has ordained for us to play a role. And might I say, what a privilege it is to be used by God don't you want to be used by God? You can answer. I'll try that again. Don't you want to be used by God? Yeah. I do. You know, frankly, if it was up to us to save people, I wouldn't like that. that that's quite the thing, right? I mean, that's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. God is kind. He says, no, I got this, okay? Just do your part. You know, and there, there are some practical implications with this. You know, people sometimes dog theology, and they'll say, you know, it isn't very practical. You know, it's just, it's just not helpful. And I would say that is not true. Because there are times when we tell people about Christ, and when we do it, we are very un-Christ-like. Uh, that was me last weekend. I'll tell you a quick story. I was, um, I was visiting my mom up in Syracuse, and I've been telling her about Jesus for years. I'm telling her, you know, how he changes people and you know, he changes lives and he's changing my life and, you know, the new creation in Christ and all that. And the problem is, last weekend, I was kind of a jerk. I was less than loving and less than honoring to her. So that did not support what I've been telling her for so many years about the new birth. And she even came at me with the dreaded, uh, why don't you practice what you preach? And, you know, that hurt. That really did hurt. Uh, and that's going to happen. So on the four-hour drive home, you know, I'm beating myself up the whole way. You know, and God comforted me with this thought that it's not up to me. You know, God is pleased with my efforts when I open my mouth and just tell people about what he has done. God is pleased with that. Even if I stink at it, you know, and I screw up sometimes, God can use me even in the midst of all my sin. And he can use you too. You know, the irony is that even that supports what I've been telling her. Because I had to apologize to her and I said, Ma, I'm a jerk, okay? That's, you know, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I need Jesus. Jerks need Jesus. <laughs> it's not about my righteousness because I don't have any. It's about him, not me. I am a total work in progress and God's not done yet. You know, the fate of my mother's soul isn't dependent on my ability to evangelize. And I thank God for that. You know, the way he set this up is just brilliant. You know, and he is very kind for doing it this way. Let's finish the passage here. Uh, verse 12. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. 
You know, there's so much could be said. I mean, there's a lot in those five verses uh, in the interest of time. Let me just say that there's one thing that's very clear, and that is God's faithfulness to protect Paul. You know, he didn't say that he would protect Paul from opposition, but from physical harm. You know, and God did just that for Paul's sake and for all those who would come after that would believe because they, they belong to God. You know, on a side note, the very last verse there that we looked at in verse 17, that guy named Sosthenes, the the ruler of the synagogue that gets the beat down, many believe that he is the same Sosthenes that is mentioned in the very first verse of 1 Corinthians as a believer. You know, if that's true, and I I tend to think it is, I'll let you, if you want to study that on your own, people are, people are, uh, they differ on this. You know, if that's true, that means there's two rulers of the synagogue in the city of Corinth that converted to Christ. Crispus was the first, Sosthenes the second, and that is amazing. As we wrap it up, I just want us to look at how the Lord provided for Paul. And I would say he provided for Paul you know, encouragement in three different ways. One was physical, one was supernatural, and one was theological. You know, The first one, physical, he gave him Aquila and Priscilla, just a couple of friends. He gave supernatural encouragement. He allowed Paul to see the fruit of his labor by seeing the conversions of unbelievers. And he also gave theological encouragement. He said, don't be afraid. Keep on talking. Do not be silent. I have my chosen people, and they need to hear the gospel. So let me say this. In the weeks and months to come, as we make our way through the the, uh, first letter to the Corinthians, let's remember our city, okay? I love this city. Harrisburg is my home. Let's dig in here. Let's plant seeds here. And let's water together. And God will produce the fruit according to His sovereign choice. Let's pray. Lord, I I love you. You are are so good. The fact that I can stand up here and, and talk about what you have revealed to us is just amazing. You're so faithful. Thank you. You've met all our needs. You give us everything that we need to go out into this you know, very dark world and be a light. This world needs the gospel, Lord. Help us to kill sin in our lives. Help us to you know, kill the fear that, that we have because it's very real, Lord. Uh, take it away. Take away everything that keeps us from you know, obeying and honoring you. And I pray that, that we as a people would do it not out of a, a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of gratitude for who you are and what you have done. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.